Today we have a very special guest on Comics and Chronic. You already know who it is. It's me, Jacob H. I'm with Anthony Iannaccio and Cody Cannon. Uh, he is an artist for Philadelphia, Nita Hawes' Nightmare blog, as well as some Spawn. And he's definitely worked on other publications. Uh, Jason Sean Alexander is in the house today. Yeah. Woo, 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 woo. Hey, here we go. How's it going? Jason. Hey, thanks so much for jo- joining us. Thanks for having me. Memorial Day. Yeah, happy oh, Memorial is, Day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think we even knew that when we scheduled it. Yeah, no yeah, way. We definitely, <laughs> I was not thinking about it. It's one of those uh, sub holidays. <laughs> <laughs> what the veterans would have wanted us to do. <laughs> <laughs> this is what they were fighting for. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, for, they fought for, for dudes doing podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's good to have you, man. We've heard a lot about you, mostly from Ronnie Barnes, of course. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had him on the pod a couple times. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, he's great. Well, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you once again for uh, coming on. Big fan of your work. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, we love. Well, thanks, man. Big fans. Honestly, one of the we, w- one of the f- earlier books we read for the podcast was Philadelphia, And then just like. It sent us down a spiral, you know. We went, uh, Philadelphia and then uh, Nita Hall, and yeah, nice. It's a good spiral. <laughs> it's good. It's exactly as far as spirals go. <laughs> <laughs> One of the healthier spirals I've had. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do have a question, just because it stood out so so much to me. I was I just finished volume one of a uh, Nita Hall's Night Nightmare blog. And there's a there's a panel in it in which it, it looks like Method Man from season four of The Wire. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, um, wait, you're talking about you said the first arc? Yeah. yeah. Here, I'll, I'll oh, you have it. Can, Let's I have it. I'm about to, I'm about to <laughs> cue it prepared. up right here. I can't <laughs> because I'm a huge fan of The Wire, and I know like Nita Hawes took place in the you know in Baltimore. So I was like, oh, dude, that looks like Method Man from The Wire. This oh, one. it could be like. So let me see it. But he's over there in the green hoodie down below. Oh, I could see that being used for the reference. That was that was definitely that's earlier. So that was Patrick. Um, yeah, I could see him using definitely little cameo. Yeah, for the reference for that. Nice. Yeah, uh, Rodney. He always puts. You know, either Rodney does it or we do it. We but we always like put little cameos here and there throughout the series. Uh, if there's somewhere in Philadelphia, you'll see Mully and Skulder. Yes, <laughs> I noticed that right yeah, away. Yeah, That's Mully. so cool. So there you go, uh, <laughs> cameos, <laughs> cameo appearances left and right. But uh, yeah. no, but that's something that always stood out to me from from the art I've seen from yours in like Philadelphia, like he's saying, Nita Hawes, Blackula. Um, do you use a lot of references? Is that like a big part of your art, or is that is that just a way to like shape what you're trying to go for? I my preference is to I love shooting photo reference of models and then just basing the drawings off of that. I try uh, Philadelphia. I definitely stick with a more realistic approach, mm-hmm. but other projects I like to exaggerate. Like I like to use the reference as a jumping off point. Uh, I still want to exaggerate and play with the the figures and the faces and stuff like that. Um, I get, I tend to get too bored if things just get too realistic all the time. Like I, I, am a, I'm a comic collector of the nineties. And so I'm like, I I need need things to jump out. (laughs) Yeah. Well, uh, what are some of your favorites, uh, favorite books from the nineties? Oh my God. I've, I've just been, uh, going over these with, uh, a buddy of mine. We've both just been on, I guess, like our middle age, you know, recollection kicks. Hell yeah. So like comics have been getting a lot of my attention lately with like Extinction Agenda X-Men and Ooh, uh, nice. the, the first couple of arcs of Spider-Man uh, with Todd and like everything that was, you know, r- around 90 to 93, you know, you know the uh, the rise of, of Casada even to like, I'm still waiting for a trade paperback of Ash to show up. So I'm like, Oh, nice. Is that a Capri Sun? Yes. 
I fucking love Capri Suns. <laughs> Remember the Capri Sun commercials where people were like looking like Silver Surfer, like if they drank Capri Sun? Or like Alex <laughs> Mack from Nickelodeon. Alex Mack, yeah, oh, exactly. Alex Mack, for sure. I love those Capri commercials. Was, Capri Sun was hard <laughs> Alex Mack energy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> And yes, I remember. I never understood why everybody would turn into liquid whatever. As, it, it didn't make sense to me as a kid, but it sold me on the idea of Capri Sun. I think that's the only reason. To make Capri Sun <laughs> seem cool. Like, if I drink that, that might possibly happen and give me power. So, I drank a I lot I was, of it. I think I was dumb enough to believe like that would happen. That's what I'm me, saying. So yeah, that I was the trick. <laughs> that's how dumb and we then were. I was really disappointed when I did not turn yeah. into silver liquid. Well, yeah, because those commercials <laughs> only aired in like afternoon cartoons. Exactly. And sessions Once and you got stuff. back from school, yep. that's when they were. Yeah. Like, <laughs> also, like if you ever like squeeze Capri Sun into a cup and drink it that way, suddenly it tastes terrible. Like if you liked it at all in the pouch, it just doesn't taste good that way. Once it hits the oxygen, it changes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, Big up, <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, so big 90s stuff. You were referencing Todd. What was it like getting to do your own art for Spawn? It was a dream come true. I, I credit that run in helping me mentally uh get to a place that I really needed to get. I had been doing fine art and comics for years. And I in that at some point I kind of started feeling like I was getting, you know, 50% of a result. You know, you spend 50% in fine art, 50% in comics. And I was like, why aren't I breaking the seal on either of these? And like, I'm gonna have to make a choice. And I was like, I I no matter what, I always saw myself drawing comics on some level to the day I died. So I was like, I gotta just give everything to comics and just, and, and put all my energies to that. Uh, so I did, but, and then I started doing empty zone, uh, through image, which was my book that I've done before. But honestly, I, I did empty zone with no research thinking image was like a company that was going to push the book and do a whole lot of its own stuff. Uh, I still had, I said, I don't, I didn't have my, my, um, I, I came up into comics by self publishing, uh, and then pushing and pushing and pushing. And I, so I just had this drive and this love of making comics. Uh, all of a sudden when I started doing every zone, I, I tended, I, I had kind of an expectation of like, people should show up. I'm, I'm an artist. I do this kind of cool stuff mm -hmm. and I didn't promote, I didn't really know what to do. Um, I had weird expectations and like, and the first arc did, did well. But like, and then the second one sales wise started to drop, but then also I started second guessing myself as a writer. Uh, and so I brought on a writing partner and, and then it didn't even necessarily feel like I was doing my book anymore. I was just working with somebody on a book. Uh, and then financially I was kind of like, it was, it was getting a little tight. And so I had to put the brakes on that. So I jumped over to uh, this book, Frostbite for Vertigo. That started one, it was just kind of nice to get income, but it was cool to be working at DC. It was cool to be working with Josh Williamson. But but still, and it, it I, I I realized though I was still was approaching it with a different mentality. I wasn't fully wasn't fully engaged. So then, luckily, Todd hit me up out of the blue, and there's the, the whole story about how I I thought he was pranking me the whole time <laughs> until I, I spoke with him uh, <laughs> on the phone. And uh, once that happened, it, it blew me away and. I knew that Todd would, if anything, because he was the first guy I ever ate, like first guy I ever just copied right out of the gate, just wanted to be like, it's still difficult for me not to do Toddisms in, in some of my work. So I'm just like, there's no way my idol is just emailing me to draw his comic. Like, and, and it happened. And so he, I knew he would push me to, to, to extremes. So I was like, he's not, he's not a timid artist. He's going to, he wants a thing. And, and he did. So when I say it helped, like, I love the experience. I, it was the biggest body of work I had done to that point. I needed all of it. And, and somewhere right before 300, somewhere in those 295s, it started clicking again. And all of a sudden I was just like, I'm drawing comics. Wait, I'm drawing comics. Like, <laughs> I just, there was this kick of like, wait. And it was through that, 
through that run of just dealing with him. And honestly, it was probably because near the 290 point, he started changing his direction for me. He brought me on to be like the horror guy to make spawn a horror movie. Uh, but then as Capullo came on to start working on 300, it started getting that old fire in him again. And he started inking and getting a part of it. And he really started becoming part of the book again. And it was part of that inspired me because he was some, he was my first love of that. And then like, so I started exaggerating Spawn more. And I was like, wait, yeah, I, I want to have fun. And, you know, and that's finally fun started coming into the equation and talking to him anytime you call him and and you can get him it's just like an injection of energy and inspiration like you just want to go draw <laughs> comics after talking to him like, he, he, he's amazing and i'm and i'm so thankful to have him now as like a resource but like yeah psychologically i came out of spawn raring to do comics and raring to do comics so much that i went to not do somebody else's character again i went to do co-creator thing with rodney you know and bonded yes. philadelphia and that's what's fueled me to do 30 issues of philadelphia <laughs> is i just love making comics after that story it's so crazy to me that that you're saying that uh like imagine like you got to draw like spider-man and it's like Steve Ditko, like telling you how to how, how he drew him and giving you pointers, and like you're hearing it from the man himself, like from a legendary yeah. comic book character that you grew up reading. It seems like that's yeah. insane to me that like that's such an amazing opportunity that you even got to do that much. It's it's nuts. <laughs> Getting to not only with one of my you know idols idols is that um, yeah, it really just helped me get back into that place of. Uh, embracing comics and loving comic art and all of that stuff your art is so unique too though like if I, if i like if i could open a page and I, I i know it's like your art you know like it's it's it feels like it takes not feels like obviously it's like the kind like you're painting it right you actually paint a lot of this or is it is it like digital depending on certain certain projects uh gone mostly digital for interiors for the last couple of years i switched over to doing a lot of digital near my end on spawn like around 300 okay that makes sense uh and then the first i think the first two issues of philadelphia are traditional mm. and then from that point i needed to speed up a bit <laughs> uh, but i try to paint traditionally i try to do covers as much as i can you know by hand nice do you still now that you're full-on into comics do you still do find out art at all as a hobby or anything or are you just like fuck it i'm doing comics <laughs> I am, uh, no, I, I'm not really doing a lot of fine art on the side. I still sketch for myself. Sketchbooks have always been important. Yeah. Uh, they they kind of just keep the engine running, really. Mm -hmm. I don't do it as much, but I do want to incorporate it into the stuff that I do love doing that I'm currently doing. Nice. Uh, and, and in that way, then maybe it, it leaves room for potential other hobbies and stuff like that. Instead yeah, of just absolutely. Instead of making comics all the time. For sure. Who are some of your favorite um, artists right now in comic books? You said, I know you collect, but do you still like read current comics? I do when there's a creative team or you know something like that on that I like. Like Mateo Scalero, he did the Mr. Freeze back one fine or one bad one day bad or day. whatever it is. Yeah, one yeah. bad day. Yep. That was great. Yeah. Fucking brilliant. He does a lot of Mark Millar books. And uh, he did the Rick, uh, Black Science. Oh yeah. yeah, that was another great series. Yeah, that was that was stellar. I I still look at like my my old guys though. I still look at like my books of Mark Texiera on Wolverine and, and Ghost Rider and that kind of stuff. Just has so much grit and energy to it. But yeah, anything like this, the seven something uh, that Jay Lee just finished or is doing. Oh, Seventh Son or something like that. Yeah, like I'm gonna be horrible with names, but yeah, I followed still writers and artists mostly, and so uh, anything Mignola is gonna put out, anything Jay is gonna put out, that kind of a thing. Nice, nice. nice. Um, but yeah, uh, sorry, I'm actually I'm stoned. I'm gonna let somebody else come <laughs> in on this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, something. Some this is really silly, but it's something that like so. Okay, so like we're like a hundred. 30 plus episodes into the podcast, but we, we've been talking about Philadelphia since like back in the single digits. And yeah. uh, we were talking about like references and, and, and uh, 
very early on in the podcast, I, I swear, like uh, James Sangster Senior, he he is that Phil Morris, like like the guy that played Jackie Childs on Seinfeld. Like, is that is that him, or is that at least modeled after him in some way? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, it is. Yes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Phil, Phil is amazing friend. Ultimate validation. <laughs> 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 Through a friend of mine that was working with him, and they were friends. Like she hooked me up. She's like, he's in the comics. Oh. I really had, uh, I really didn't think that he would actually show up. So, he, <laughs> uh, so, um, so I I ran it through with him and told him who Rodney was, and so I think he either recognized the name or at least he knew those projects. And um, yeah, he, he posed. He's he's posed. Uh, he posed live with me for a senior i want to say it was it might have just been the full art for number one and maybe i've just used and even because we started changing the focus uh i was able to kind of use pre-existing photos uh of him uh and just kind of jumping up but yes that's sorry i'm, I'm gonna go off on a digression about how i use the rest <laughs> no of that's like, really yeah. interesting to know yeah <laughs> No, that's really cool. Uh, he's amazing. It, yeah, it seemed it seemed like it was him right away, and it just but it it, it adds like that realistic layer to it because like it's almost like I could see it visually like as a real person, even though your art is just like so it already is there, you know. Like, yeah, it, uh, it's just so cool. I love the way you do that with a lot of your characters. Thank you, uh, thank you. That was uh, it. Was fun, and uh, and I think it was issue four or something like that where we had a rapper Blake. Uh, Blake, yes. Yes. oh yeah, <laughs> we we, we, we noticed that one right away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was my dumbass that had to actually look it up. I was like, who? And so <laughs> and then I saw these. Yeah, I, I was not. I was. I guess I was familiar of his existence, but I really didn't know any of Drake's music or anything like that. Yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious. So then I got to listen to it. And then it was fun to kill him. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's like literally. That's <laughs> For hearing I say, no, he's good. <laughs> and isn't that what we called our uh, second Philadelphia episode like see Drake bleed or something like that <laughs> <laughs> so we've only heard about you from Rodney we want to know what's it like uh, we want to know from your perspective what's your side of the story what's it like working with Rodney oh my <laughs> oh, so very similar stories. Okay, very similar. <laughs> stories. Um, he has gone on record on our podcast as calling you an asshole. So <laughs> we, we have that recorded. <laughs> um, I, 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 my son's right there. So I'm going to say it's been a, it's a, it's a, a challenge. It's been a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious! Great answer. Yeah. <laughs> that is that is really cool that you guys can work with each other and put out a great product and still be like, yeah. Sometimes you get on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we can. It's we're so similar. We got on, we get on each other's nerves. <laughs> So, uh, as someone who likes to partake, do you partake when you're creating? Um, <laughs> nice. Ah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Go. I'm going back for round I two. I feel like you needed that. I could see uh, <laughs> some anxiety building in you there. <laughs> it only gets like, see, this is, you know, <laughs> nice. that'll be super patient dad. That's cool. I'm going to have to bring you guys out with me. No, go ahead. I'm going to be super, super professional. <laughs> do it. You are the. Let me see. The sun's that way, so I know at least enough not to blind you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Are you in LA? I'm in LA. Nice. Me too. Oh man, what was the next? Oh, do you? Yeah, that's the question. Do you partake while you're creating, or do you like to create sober? No, I. <laughs> I'm, I'm very much a part of the Seth Rogen method. I guess I'm a wake and bake. Hell yes. It's throughout the day. Sometimes I'll have edibles that kind of extend it so I don't have to smoke as much uh, when my wife gets a little concerned about my lungs. Yeah, that makes sense. That's the worst part about aging. Right. 
Right. <laughs> my lungs ain't what they used to be, you know? <laughs> but, I, yeah. but I found, like, even with the kids, or, like, like with the kids, like, when I'm working, and it's taken me, like, ten times longer to finish a page, uh, and I'm dawdling around, I was like, oh, I don't want to finish this page. I'm like, oh. So I go out, and I have a smoke, I come back, and I start finishing the page. Like, <laughs> nice. It takes all the second guessing and anxiety out, and it's like, dude, it's not a thing. It's just a fucking building. Draw some bricks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I love nice. getting high in like writing because it, it like makes me kind of do it like automatic writing or unconsciously. And I don't have to think about those little fuck ups and typos and whatever I'm doing. Like it just helps so much. That's cool. That's validating yeah. to hear from an artist of your caliber that you could do that and you still do it so well. Like I feel like people always get the fucking wrong idea about stoners. Like it shouldn't affect oh. what work output is, you know? Like, if people knew the squirrels in my goddamn brain, they could pay to weed. No, it, um, I think especially for creative, for me, uh, it creates instant objectivity mm. and I automatically s- take nothing personally. <laughs> like, you nice. can take the shit out of my art and as long as, you know, I've had a puff, like, we can have at it. Like we can, yeah, any, anything. I, I don't, if I start feeling too comic booky or too whatever, I'll have a puff. And then I come back and I'm like, just draw the goddamn thing. <laughs> yeah. It just takes a lot of that, a lot of that nonsense thinking out of the way and just kind of clears the road for me. See, for me, I can't, I, I can't like at most be just like moderately high when I'm doing my creative stuff. I agree. But my wife, no, my wife is she when she smokes, that's it. Like it's time to break open the chips and turn yeah. on the TV. Yep. Yeah. 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 I, just, I don't I don't write well and I don't perform well when I'm high. Same. <laughs> uh, perform especially. Perform is awful for me. But writing, I, as long as I'm like not too high, then writing tends to go well. But yeah. That's uh that's interesting and I'm glad to hear it. Uh, that's yeah. a conversation we should have with more of our creators. Yeah. Damn these. But guys. but it's like rare <laughs> to actually have creators on that do smoke with us and do say that they smoke. Like it's just you, maybe they don't want to do it publicly, but I, I get the impression that a lot of the creators come on just don't do it. And that's fine. Like, we're not trying... Like, you could come on as a creator and you don't have to smoke at all. That's not true, Anthony. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, I think it's it's it helps my artistic process so much. And I feel... Uh, I'm surprised when I don't hear... Like, I feel like comic books, I almost want to say it needs it more. Sometimes things feel a little stiff. Like, it needs a shake-up, you know? Yeah, people take a lot of shit in comics. Seriously, agree. Uh, that makes sense. A lot of the fans should smoke. I'll tell you that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I I love. It. I genuinely, uh, and I was really uh, just a booze hound, you know, all of my life. And so it was my wife. Um, I, I've only been. I'm 47. I've only been smoking. I started smoking weed in my mid to late 30s. My late 30s. And it was to help me go to sleep. She was like, oh, my God, you're literally... And I was not good at it, but it genuinely helped cool, you know, chill me out. Because So we started with edibles. And she was like, you're literally the first person I've known that has taken weed medicinally. To, because I was such... I'm such a lightweight. I would take a pump. That's it. That's it for the night. Like, it was gone. And then cut to probably eight years later. Like, just slowly as it started easing my anxiety and I started getting more acquainted with it, my tolerance started to kind of build up. Then it, you know, it was just like my, my work regiment. I told my assistant, it looks like the special needs studio because I have to, I have to go out and take my puff. And so I have, I get stoned. I come back in and I have to put on my glasses and then, uh, I put in earbuds, like not <laughs> to listen to music necessarily. Sometimes just the ones you, you get for concerts, Yeah, uh, you put your ears, but I have severe, uh, ADHD and, sound is so sensitive to me and distracting that mm. I put those in and then and added to being a little stoned. Oh my God. It's like the blinders. <laughs> nice. I, can, Pretty I, can cool. just, I can sit there and draw and get panel after panel just nice. going. And I'm like, it's the best way I can close out the outside world and, and get my work done. So yeah. So it takes a lot sometimes. <laughs> 
That's no, awesome. I can totally relate to that. That's so cool. No, that's just so cool to hear. I think I think it's like like you guys are saying, sometimes like smoking, like it's not for you if you're creating something, but I don't know. It's so cool. I I feel like I need it to uh get shit done a lot of the time. Like this fucking podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's how I get anything done. I you know, I take the days off and like I'm a I'm a neat freak and so I go board the house, but like I'll go and smoke and then put in some music and i'm like i tear through that i don't like enjoy the housekeeping <laughs> yeah. and i'm sweating like it's my job and i love it i get this crazy hyper focus um yeah my my everything's been a little bit better <laughs> because of weed <laughs> nice. but again That's you know cool. i'm getting you know occasionally if my wife gets really stoned you know like i'll i'll pull out one of my like special occasion joints that are all just crazy percentages and shit like that. So I can get <laughs> ached with her. But for the most part, it's really just, you know, there's definitely those moments of like, woohoo. but like for the most part, it's just keeping me productive. Like right. I have, you know, I, I'm sure the, they hate me in this, my, my office building where my studio <laughs> is. Cause <laughs> the building itself is like for, um, physical therapy and, and special needs kids school <laughs> in the building. And then they're <laughs> out there smoking pot. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm polite enough to like walk a few blocks away now, but, <laughs> you know, out of my system looking for places to rent. <laughs> I, I, the one question we failed to ask is what's the rest of the building. <laughs> <laughs> So it's been weird to have like a full out comic book uh, bullpen inside a inside this type of facility. Uh, it mm-hmm. makes life interesting, but you know I'm also like counting the days for the lease to be up. <laughs> so, uh. <laughs> it's time to move. So, uh, so earlier you mentioned the comic, the Empty Zone. Are you working on more of the Empty Zone? I, I think I saw you tweet something about that a while back. Yes. Ooh. I. Uh, I just and it, I've, it's that love I was talking about earlier. Um, I've loved it enough to do the longest run I've ever done on Philadelphia, and we're still we're still going. We have a plan to get to a certain number. Nice, but um, but I have so missed just telling my own stories my way, that kind of a thing. And so yeah, this time, uh, and that's where I'm hoping I can see that it's hopefully it's better because. The scripting has taken about 10 times longer than previous attempts. So <laughs> it's, I, I feel like in the time I've, I've, since I've done Empty Zone to the time now, I wanted the stories to really work. I didn't want, I didn't want necessarily just to blah, this is the stuff I like. This is what the stuff I think is cool. I was like, you know what? No, I want my pacing to be better. I want to know at least what the fuck structure is. I was like, <laughs> maybe I'm all my stuff at the end and, and I found like so, and so I started jumping into screen playbooks and uh, and really enjoying finally, and I never did before. Again, helpful thanks to you know we audio books. <laughs> I'm just and I'm re-listening to these books over and over again, and um, and just getting so inspired and understanding some level of structure, and it was some help. And and I was like, oh shit, I just need to be told where things go. <laughs> and so this this round, I'm. So so much more excited because I'm not just, I never really had a plan with empty zone, empty zone beyond I'm enjoying doing my own book. Now I have multiple arcs planned. I have a bigger universe planned for this series and it's a real, it's enjoying it. It's, it, I'm enjoying the hell out of it. So yes, or like the work is being started now by the end of this year conventions. I hope to have like a nineties style, old school ash can of like a little preview of uh empty zone to give out at conventions and stuff like that so Mm. then it would be hopefully february to april of next year empty zone will start coming out and it's just my full horror cyberpunk series Uh, that's cool That (laughs) that sounds cool as fuck i can't wait it's really everything i like to draw so it's yes. it's and I just and I feel like it works and I'm really proud of it. Like I'm really, you know, I, I you know, one of these books I uh, listened to was, you know, they they nailed me right out of the gate. They're like, can you tell me what it's about? And I realized I couldn't tell anybody what, what <laughs> I was working on was about. It got really long winded, and uh, and then no, so all of that it helped being 
you know, and I guess like with anything, with life, with art, with writing, anything, like, you know, put that focus, you know, like make sure you have these answers, make sure you know what the fuck you're doing, and then then go play. So it's been it's been helpful. I, I you know, I at least feel like I know more than I did to make me a more competent storyteller. And so then hopefully the pictures, you know, bring me across the finish line. <laughs> nice. Uh so other than Empty Zone, how many pro uh projects are you working on at the moment? Oh, oh. um roughly four. My studio uh we have a a good creative group there and we're hoping to we're looking to launch an imprint uh, early next year. And it's mostly, you know, again, genre books, horror and sci-fi and that kind of a thing. Uh, right. And so on nice. different levels, I'm working on a horror graphic novel and a sci-fi suspense miniseries. Uh, and some I'm um, doing layouts and inks like I am on Philadelphia, And then some of them I'm doing layouts and writing and, just different aspects uh, in Philadelphia or then empty zone is the thing that gets like, like all of it, you know, the writing and the yeah. art and everything else gets like part of me. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. So multiple projects, including the, the, the crazy Philadelphia stuff that we have planned with spawn and all that stuff. Yeah. That was such a fucking yeah. crazy reveal. Wow. I don't think anybody <laughs> saw it coming. And then now we have to wait till like October, right? To, is that when the next arc starts up? Oh man, it's, it's such a crazy. It's like what? What? Oh man, can you talk? <laughs> any, can you like tell us anything about that? Like what's in store? Or like I don't know. Any teasers? Or who? Who even like came up with the idea to merge Spawn into your Philadelphia universe? Uh, Rodney and I came up with the idea somewhere about a year ago, and. Uh, so for about a year, I, I planted the seed in Todd's head, and I would kind of like nudge here while in conversation. <laughs> would it be cool if there's a Bond Philadelphia crossover? Like, you know, we have we have magic people now, so it makes sense. <laughs> and so he was like, "We'll talk, we'll talk." I'm launching my own universe right now. I'm like, "Oh, okay, <laughs> we'll do it." Uh, and then he's launching all of his titles, and then you know, uh, picture, you know, it says a thousand words, and. Um, he had the anniversary of Spawn, where every image book got to do, got to put Spawn on the cover. Yeah, and so I was like, I'm not fucking around. I'm going to put Philadelphia. I'm going to put Spawn as a Philadelphia vampire on the cover. That was such a sick cover. Thank you. <laughs> I fully with like it was a pitch cover, man. Like oh, that's, that's so I cool. think that's where it had extra energy because then like we came around to the end of into issue thirty and we're like, and then it was right. He was like. It'd be cool if like we get spawn to show up at the end. And I'm like, <laughs> give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh and so I then I got serious with the pitch and I was like, Rodney, give me at least a base storyline of what the hell it is you would even do. <laughs> he gave me a good a little rundown and then I gave it to Todd and his people. Then I wouldn't go away about it. So I kept asking, like, you get to it? Did you get to it? Because we're getting close to our deadline. Then basically Todd calls and does does it like how he does anything else while he's doing something else. He's uh, inking some pages. I forget. I don't think it was the Spawn Batman stuff, but it might have been. But while he was inking, he was like, so what's this? What? What? Uh, you want to use Spawn for, for some stuff? <laughs> <I'm> like, <"Yeah." laughs> you know, this next arc, you know, we'll just introduce him in 30 and like, you know, don't worry. Like he's, he gets to be a badass and he's killing vampires and then demons and uh, so there's, there's a tease. And, uh, um, mm -hmm. and so, uh, he was like, um, okay. Uh, sounds good. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, That's so cool. cool. So how you doing? <laughs> 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 you know, and then he thought, so then we just spend the next 30 minutes talking about whatever Todd wants to talk about. <laughs> um, but so that's, that's where it was. I got off the phone and I was just like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, I called Rodney. I was like, "We that we we get to do it." And no, <laughs> so because we we had already started working on it as though we were getting to do it anyway. Um, nice. We already had been working on the pencils for it. I had done the layout for it, and so uh, I was like, "I'm going to ink this page no matter what." <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so then we have it, and, and dude, I, let me tell you, I know I, I love I love doing this because I genuinely mean it. I feel like I've had good follow through each time. 
you really have no idea what's coming on this next arc. <laughs> 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 it's crazy when like Spawn is like just one of the big deals. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so there's, there's like STs that I can give is that much like, you know, yeah, we, we don't do anything small. So it, it's going to get even bigger. Yeah. Philadelphia is just one of those. It gets so big. Yeah, Philadelphia is like one of those series that keep, just keeps building and building and getting better and better. Like it's just, I'm always looking forward to reading Philadelphia. It's just like I, when you yeah. say that, like I believe you because it does happen every volume. Where it's just like, holy shit, holy shit. There's just so many <laughs> holy shit moments, but they're so earned too because of all the characters. Like I care about all the characters, and part of that is your art. Like, like again, like I, there's so much emotion in all these pages. It's just like, ugh, oh, always yeah. like gets to me. Yeah, thank you. We. That's Ronnie and I, like, if we want, if we have a sad moment or we have a moment, he tells me, he's like, I want to make the reader cry. And I'm like, I want to make the reader cry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, as, as hard as, as I can, yeah. Like, it's really the only important thing to me in art is, is emotion. Like, I, you know, I, I don't know color theory. I, I never studied composition. But, like, what hits me is emotive work. And that's where I, you know, if things are drawn off or exaggerated or whatever, it's to uh, get me there. It's to get me to an emotional reaction. And so luckily, Rodney's a dramatic motherfucker and uh, in the writing and like, uh, and I tell him, I'm like, I, I appreciate his writing because I, yeah, I tell him, I don't think there's any, I was like, we don't have any filler, man. Like each issue gets better and better. Seriously. And I was like, and someone asked, my favorite issue uh of the last of the last arc and i told him it was abigail it was abigail's death on the second issue and uh i said because like dude you you once you've killed sangster like that's gonna upset people right like, that's gonna there's gonna like oh the what was me i was like well once you do abigail then they won't know what to believe yeah exactly. <laughs> Just like, yeah. Like, like wait a second does that mean anyone can die so <laughs> So yeah, that, that was like that was a was roller coaster. <laughs> that arc, it's just like bam, 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 bam. No one's safe. Oh my god, it was so. F <laughs> that thing is a blast, and yeah, we again just yeah, it just still it doesn't stop getting bigger and bigger. It really did start so very family oriented, and then um, yeah, dude, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really the intent going all the way to the end. It gets it's get it gets pretty epic. Uh, It'll be, you know, I think in hindsight, when people were really able to see like the omnibuses and really see these stories all put together, see this really kind of crazy trajectory that just kind of keeps going. We don't really have a lot of down spots. And there's also like moments recently, especially um, with Anansi and um, fucking, uh, wow, how could I forget his name? Oh my God. Um, he could go to hell. What, what's the dude's name? Fuck. Corson? Not Corson. Uh, are you talking about uh, Seesaw? Seesaw, yes. I, Tevin, yes. Okay, Seesaw, yeah. Like, he, his journey has been, like, so, like, and I, and I don't mean this, like, in any exa exaggeration, but even your art, like, it feels, like, so Sandman-esque, like, the way his adventure is going. And that's, like, drawing me in more than anything. I'm like, holy shit, like, it's not just the vampire story. There's, like, this crazy mythology that you guys are doing, and visually it matches the story. Like, ah, it's incredible. Thank you. I, I, you know, the thing is, is like, I was not into doing a vampire book and it was really him explaining to me that becomes more than a vampire book. And so on some level, I, I always hate that we had this, that it kind of started that way, because if you're not a fan of vampires per se, you, it might be a turn off. But I'm like, no, it's genuinely, if there was a, a new Vertigo book, it would be Philadelphia. Like, Hell yeah. there's like, you know, cause his, cause, um, Randy comes from like he he's such a fan of the Alan Moore Swamp thing and all that kind of shit. Like we're yeah, we, there's more magic and there's more crazy surreal everything to come. Yeah, I think over time, especially when people really s discover the series, they're gonna see like how uh, how how insane it is. Like I'm I'm still, I'm really, really proud, you know, working with him aside. Like I'm still very proud to be working. With him. <laughs> <laughs> the good this great series. <laughs> yeah, no, it really is. And we we stumbled upon Philadelphia early on in like our first 10 or 12 episodes. 
just trying to find things that weren't mainstream. And uh, so what started off is like just that, like I, I stay buying your guys' books. Um, yeah. It's awesome. Like, hell yeah. Yeah. It's Thank definitely you. one of the, one of like our favorite g- discoveries that we've made since starting the podcast. Yeah. Hard agree. Yeah. Nice. What's been some of the other? Mm. Mm. Oh, Red Fork. We really like yeah. Red, yeah. Red, Red Fork. From Did TKO. You? Really? Yeah. Yeah. I've seen it on the stands. I haven't picked it up. It's really it's good. It's really good. It's like a, a, What's his name? The the horror. It's like a. <laughs> I'm, damn it! We is guy? not my being my friend. Uh, Lovecraftian. There's like a Lovecraftian horror kind of uh, that takes place in rural West Virginia, which is where I'm from. So uh, that was definitely one of my favorites too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I read for it. Also read uh we read Snagglepuss. Oh, Snagglepuss! I was just gonna say Snagglepuss was great by Mark Russell, and that was really cool. That's awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. He was a he was a communist playwright, a, a queer communist playwright in this version. It was, it was sick. Yeah, <laughs> highly recommend it. Seriously, it's I yeah, know no, it's just like seriously. Snagglepuss. What the fuck? But like, it's yeah. so good. It's so good. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> is awesome, but it's also just like I, I like comics. I think have to be have some sort of ridiculous elements. Like not that it's ridiculous, but the fact that like in Philadelphia, for instance, is like you've recreated past presidents, but like updated their looks. Like did you? That's like what for? Like for instance, like John Adams when he comes back, he's like he's got a bald head, he's got the beard. Like what makes you just make John Adams look like that suddenly? Like that's obviously not like historically like John Adams like. <laughs> His vibe changes completely when he comes back. Hot John Adams. Yeah, yeah, he is hot John Adams. Yeah, that's that's big dick energy, John. Adams. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, and I'm gonna I'll serve it back to him because I have an asshole writing the thing that didn't bother researching like <laughs> what John looked like because he's like sexy John Adams though. I'm like sexy John. <laughs> what do you mean John sexy Adams. John Adams? There is no sexy. Have you seen the <laughs> and i was just like oh my god and and then there was there was i feel like there was a moment where he was like he goes to sangster goes to uh adam's grave uh and like there's a crack in it and he's like listening to it or or looking in there and then so i'm like looking it up and i'm like he doesn't have a grave rodney he's got a (laughs) down there with his other Wife and people, and it's not the same situation. <laughs> so I had to rework visually to make that scene, to make some scenes work when it comes to like some kind of accuracy. And so it was like he had this beautiful uh, two page spread of of time passing, and I told him like that's where we'll do it because it, I was like we'll say vampirism makes you the best that you can possibly be. And so we're going to show him over the time. And Rodney was like, yeah, that's true. There's no carbs in blood. (laughs) So we have a way to at least to start trimming him up and make him sexy. And then like, so at least there was just something in my brain that needed it to be plausible because I'm like, everybody knows what John Adams looks like. (laughs) I I also like that you made the vampires able to change because I feel like, I would have got stuck on the interview with the vampire lore. Right. Of when Kirsten Dunst gets, you know, like whatever you get turned to a vampire is how you look forever. Like when she cuts right. her hair and it grows back right away. <laughs> uh, right. There's, I, I, I like that. You I don't change. think we, we dove so much because, you know, you are who you are. You just become like your best physical possible self. You know, like Brittany's always going to be 11. She's just going to be the strongest 11 year old. <laughs> you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, um, I know Ronnie has like put his family, like his daughters and some of his comics and Quinn credible. Do you ever like artistically, do you try to fit your family in there? Oh, uh, absolutely. Mostly as background people and, and some characters, my wife I've put as a character, she was a bartender in empty zone and I killed her. <laughs> and then I had to make that up to her. So then I made the, the lead character in Frostbite for Vertigo. Uh, so then she got to be an action star. So I was back in her good grace. Nice. <laughs> she she pops up throughout. I pop up throughout. But um, so Brittany 
uh, rips the head off of a policeman in one issue. Yeah. And if you look at the policeman, is, the policeman is Rodney. Uh, oh, he, should, uh, he, the, he, he wanted to actually be in that scene and have his head pulled off by her. So they literally both pose. And, and, and so she rips off his head. That's awesome. There's another scene where Abigail is standing there holding two heads and I made it mine and Rodney's head. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this kind of, you know, becoming infamous scene of uh, Brittany, who is Rodney's daughter, holding this girl in her mouth like a terrier. Uh, oh, yeah. And the girl, my daughter. <laughs> so, oh, shit. <laughs> my daughter's posed for a lot of stuff she's not allowed to even see yet. So <laughs> she can't know that she was this body hanging out of, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so, everybody, because I love using reference, everybody, friends, family, uh, Seesaw's uh, grandmother that he sees in the hospital and that's when she passes, he sees the afterlife is my mother-in-law. Nice. Oh, awesome. oh. <laughs> that's incredible. Nice. That's cool. So it's, yeah, it's all fun. And, and the first person to pose for Seesaw, and I feel like such an ass cause I'm, I just lost his name, but uh, Macy Gray's son. <laughs> oh shit. Oh, shit. Uh, who my wife worked with on stuff and um, on a, on a movie, but the, um, but through that, yeah, yeah. So she's like my son, I suppose. And so, so he was the first kind of seesaw, and how it was kind of, yeah. Nice. If you ever need a photo reference for the son of John Adams, hit me up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, th- th- thank you so much for coming on. Really, yeah, this is a great that, time, dude. This was so much fun. Go, oh, awesome, absolutely. But you can come back anytime. This is this was a fun time. Yeah, this is whenever, like a really fun talk. If you, whenever uh, Empty Zone starts to launch, if you yeah, want to come back yeah. on and promote it, absolutely. Yeah, I know. I'm going to be a lot more like out out in public when that happens. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Until then, man, I, gotta, I just got to make comments. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. You guys, Rago, oh. this was a blast. Um, oh, hell yeah. yeah. That's thank awesome. Yeah. That's all we want to hear, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this was no, great. Cool. No, you guys made for easily the most unique one of these I've ever done, but you, you are all fucking Fuck awesome. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, you. Seriously. Thank you. Yeah, that really means a lot. Yeah. Nice. All right, I'm going to go with those guys. All right. All right. Yeah. Have a great well, one. Uh, Thanks again, yeah, Jason. Have a great night. Thanks, guys. Take care. Take it easy. Hi, you're listening to Comics and Chronic, and I'm Jacob H. I'm Cody Cannon. And I'm Anthony Iannaccio. And you can tune in every Thursday to hear new episodes of Comics and Chronic. And make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, at Comics and Chronic. That's Comics, the letter N, Chronic. We'll see you guys next week. Woo! Peace.